All right, guys. Um, how many of you were with me for 3 at 3 on Friday with uh, Amy Smart? That was so much fun. By the way, I'm going to announce a winner at the end of 3 at 3 today to uh, who won the Fat Quarter Bundle with the two patterns from Riley Blake. So stay tuned for that. But uh, it was such a wonderful experience for me to be able to have some time with someone that I highly respect in the industry and to be able to kind of talk to her about like where she gets her inspiration from and uh, be able to talk about her newest patterns, her, her fabric that's out now. It was so fun. If you did not get a chance to watch that, I would encourage you to go back and be able to um, participate in that by just watching. It's just a few few posts down and you can see, um, just kind of get a, a glimpse of a little bit about Amy Smart and uh, she's, she's a pretty neat person. Really, really like her. But it was interesting because uh, when we were talking, we were talking about those things that take us right back to uh, back in time, if you will. And it's those those nostalgic pieces that just, you know, bring back memories, right? And if you remember, she was talking about uh, having, um, gingham and I, and Jenny and I were saying she, perf she perfected gingham. I don't know how you could be more perfect with gingham, but she, she's done an amazing job of utilizing gingham in all of her fabric collections and plaids and all of those things. And so, uh, you know, she, uh, we were talking about that and someone had mentioned about the term chicken scratch. So we got on the subject of chicken scratch, and some of you knew what it was. You, it took you right back to aprons and uh, table coverings and placemats and things that your uh, mothers or grandmothers taught you how to do. And there were many of you who had never even heard of the term chicken scratch. So I thought, you know what? Let's talk about chicken scratch today. How about it? Because interestingly enough, chicken scratch is making a comeback. You know, everything does that. Those circles, they just circle around. And so I thought, and, and a lot of you shared, you know, items that were done in chicken scratch that you have in your homes and you were sharing, sharing photographs and things like that. And so uh, you were sharing them on the club Facebook page and the friends of my girlfriend's quilt shop page. And so many of those items are tied to memories. And that's one thing that I absolutely love about, about what we do, right? It's, it's something that takes us right back. And yes, Larry, you're right. Everything old is new again. And so it's coming back. So uh, I thought that today I would talk a little bit about chicken scratch. I, you know, I, I've done it with my mother-in-law. I was sharing some of that with you. In fact, I've got a quilt here to show you. And um, I, I remember doing this with her. And, uh, but after the conversation on Friday, I said, you know, I, I'm going to do a little more research and find out like a little bit more of the history of chicken scratch. And so that's what I'm going to visit with you today. And I'm going to show you some basic stitches. All right. So first of all, what is it? Right. And let me show you a picture. Linda sent me this picture. Uh, this is from uh, a website called Needle and Thread, which is actually uh, some of the information I'm going to share with you today is from there. So I recommend you checking that out if you want to learn more about what chicken scratch looks like. It's very, um, very intriguing. But basically, chicken scratch is done um, mostly, not all, but mostly on gingham. And um, let me bring up a few things here. Let's see. Okay, so chicken scratch, let me see if I can get this to pop up. No, not that one. There we go. 
has it's coined by a few names. Some people know it as chicken scratch. Um, others might refer to it as depression lace, which I'll tell you why that is the case here in just a minute. Some may refer to it as snowflake embroidery. Um, you know, there's lots of different names for it, okay? And <clears throat> Also, what I found, come to found, uh, find out that it was actually, there are examples of chicken scratch that actually date back to the early 1800s, which quite surprised me because it was actually, you, you can find examples that date back to then, but then it was made more popular during the 1900s, which was... If, if you think about history, that actually makes a lot of sense because it actually happened the first half of the 1900s. This is uh, especially during the time of the Great Depression because it was inexpensive and it was a simple way to decorate gingham fabric. And it looked like lace that was put upon gingham on, on this check fabric. So gingham was really popular um, and, and this lacy look of being able to hand stitch something became more popular during the Great Depression. So that's why you might hear the term uh, of it being called depression lace is because that's what a lot of people did at that time, which I also found to be very interesting. So while it dates back to the 1800s, while it takes us back to the early 1900s during the Depression, when would you say it was made Repopular again. Okay, what era do you guys remember even more so of, of this being quite popular? I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on that. While you type that in, I'm going to show you an example here. Okay, yes, Brenda says you can get very fancy with chicken scratching. And Diana has heard of depression lace. Okay, some of you are saying 1950s, the 70s, the 50s, the 70s, 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 yes, all of the above, yes. But you know when the term, so you guys are absolutely right, ah, Jennifer, Jennifer said the 1980s, and this is what I learned in my research. Um, I learned that the, the term chicken scratch, uh, though it has many names attributed to it, uh, to this kind of embroidery, okay, it was very wildly popular, popularized during the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, okay, and it's mainly because there was a company out there called Pegasus Originals that had actually produced several books on chicken scratch, um, that became extremely popular, and all of a sudden, everybody was back to doing chicken scratch again. There were charts and books, and after a few years of that, the popularity waned again. I mean, that's something that happens. We're used to that, right? And now, who would have thought, but it's now coming back again. So, it's popular again, but I would say it's popular again probably due to the popularity of gingham again, and we're seeing gingham in a lot, a lot of fabric lines. So let me show you um, this quilt. This is actually Sweet Mallory here. She is on our marketing team. Her husband is actually my nephew. And I was talking about Chicken Scratch today, and I was telling all of you about how my mother-in-law had made uh, Chicken Scratch quilts for all the grandkids for and she, she didn't know how many, you know, grandkids she'd end up having, but she, for years, she would take large blocks and actually stitch them out so that when they did get married, she would now then put it into a quilt. And so she had these quilts in all different colors. And I was going to grab Jess's quilt, but it's down in Sandy today. So I wasn't able to find it, but Mallory happened to have her quilt with her and so take a look you can get an idea here let's see there we go you can see the gingham and so on Friday when I was talking about this I referred to having these little asterisks and I remember first joining in the family 
and you know we'd be over at Ron and Bobby's house which are Mike's parents and she would be stitching these and she showed me how to stitch them and so I would stitch them along with her and we would create these stars out of um, the gingham and so again these are like king size quilts and she started years and years and years ago but all she would do is she would just make the blocks and then once the kids were getting married she would then turn those blocks into quilts and she would let the kids actually decide what um, color they wanted so I believe Jessica's is burgundy uh, this one is purple which is um, Chase and Mallory's and um, they're beautiful and they're timeless and and it it Actually, it means a lot to me as I look at those those quilts now because I remember how much time Bobby had spent on making those. And, and to me, it's just like another, uh, it's like a love note. What, you know, we were talking about with Amy Smart. It's like a love note when you when you make these things for, for other people. Okay. Um, I bet a lot of you can go back and you can think about like aprons that you've seen. Uh, and done in this way and I was talking to Barb and she said she has table runners that her her mom had made for her um, interestingly enough there was we used to um, here at my girlfriend's quilt shop in Logan we had an attic space that w was up above us and we called it my girlfriend's attic it's where we had a lot of classes and retreats and and things like that and um, we had some old vintage items hanging from the ceilings and on the walls because we wanted it to be a place that it it took us back it reminded us all of that these are the same things that our mothers and grandmothers and grandfathers and you know loved to do for years and years and years even before we came right um, and so one of those items that was actually donated from a customer was this pillow Again, this probably takes you right back, doesn't it? And it's uh, this one was done with yarn, which I think is so fun. It also reminds me of when I was growing up, and I was in a like a young women's church group, and I remember uh, learning how to cross stitch on on this gingham. So it wasn't necessarily chicken scratch, if you will, but it was. It was a wonderful way to learn how to um, how to do uh, embroidery, okay, and how to do cross stitch in in a way that was you know large blocks and 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 just was easy to find. You didn't it didn't take a lot of counting, and so this is a wonderful way to teach children is on a piece of gingham, even if it's simply cross stitch. Okay, so um, let me share with you, and I wish to this day, I wish I had uh, those, those, those items I made. You know, they've long been long gone. They've been probably thrown away, donated, whatever it might be, because so many years ago, I never, I never really appreciated it, right? So let's take a look at some examples. Uh, here's a picture I found um, on the internet. And look how beautiful that is. Again, it's it's you can get as fancy or you know just as basic as you want it to be. Um, but the aprons, yeah, take us right back. Here's a star, uh, very similar to the stars that my mother-in-law had done, but by using different thread colors, it gave you a different look. And again, it gives this feel of lace over top. Here's another photo I found. Isn't that gorgeous? So beautiful. And this one you will also notice is actually uh, an eighth of an inch size of gingham. So while we have, this is the most commonly known that people will, will find and will refer to as like the quarter inch, but there's also uh, nothing wrong with doing it with an eighth inch. It's going to take a little bit longer. It's going to be a little bit smaller, but it really is going to be something amazing. Let's take a look at some more examples that I found. Ah, look at those. 
aren't those beautiful? I mean, they're so pretty. I would never want to actually get them dirty, right? It would be almost one of those house aprons that you would never want to uh, wipe your dirty hands on, right? But um, here's another example. Now, this one is a little bit more intricate. Interestingly enough, as I was researching, uh, there are some basic stitches of the, the of chicken scratch, but... Then you get into some even more intricate examples of it. And you're going to find that even more so when it comes to doing, uh, for those who are back in Europe, in Australia, those areas of the world actually have taken some real basic stitches of, of chicken scratch and have really just taken it to a whole new level. It's really, really amazing. Okay, so let me see if I can find some of those examples. Okay, here's this one I thought was really cool. Um, there was this scale I found. Okay, let's take a look at that. Now, um, here, by using some different colors, uh, of the embroidery thread, the embroidery floss, I should say, she was able to stitch up these flowers, which I look, I, I love the look of that. But look at what she turned it into. This is from someoftheirstories.com. And she took up, she made a gingham blouse, but then she was able to do that across the top. Very, a, a very similar look to smocking. Okay, if you, those of you familiar with smocking, that kind of gives that, that look and feel to it. There's also ways to do this uh, chicken scratch by pulling threads rather than just using the embroidery thread. You could be using pulled threads as well within the weave of the fabric. It's, it's fascinating to me. Here you're going to get a little bit more delicate. Now look at that. I don't know how well you can see this, but if you look closely... Look at that. That is gorgeous. So this isn't this is not your basic chicken scratch. This is definitely taken it to a whole new level. If you look at some of those quarter inch squares, you have actually four cross stitches in one square. Is that gorgeous or what? So um and here's one more picture to look at. So oodles and oodles and oodles of pictures out there photographs it just again i think it's absolutely beautiful so today for our demonstration i thought i would share with you some basic stitches of of chicken scratch and even if it's something that you think chris i will never ever do that it might be interesting for you to stay and 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 still watch and see some of the things that um that are, I think, I find very fascinating. Am I gonna go home right away and make one? Probably not, you know, but you never know. One day I might go, you know, I really would like to try something uh, that is relaxing. It's very relaxing to do handwork. You can take it with you anywhere you go. So that's why I like to, I like to learn new things, even if it's not something I might do right away. Uh, Marilyn, good point. She said it's kind of a very easy version of Hardanger. Yes, and there are some amazing Hardanger uh, designs out there. That's that's a whole nother whew, amazing um, uh, talent out there. Okay, so I grabbed some gingham. Um, isn't this cute? I love the pink and the orange. I think it's so fun. And this is my finished example just to show you what I'm going to about. I'm about to show you. And I'm going to go over. There are really three basic stitches when it comes to doing, uh, to doing it. Okay. And let me bring that up here so you can see. Okay. The basic stitches are one the double cross stitch and that's the one I was used to when I was talking to Amy on Friday about it and I said you know it's like a almost like a snowflake like an asterisk if you will that is what I was taught from my mother-in-law there we go 
was doing that what they refer to as a double cross stitch. Uh, then there's the running stitch, and then those running stitches are what make it possible to do woven circles. So I've got some little um, step outs here to help us along the way. The first thing that you do is that if you're going to do a quarter inch gingham, then it's probably best to start out with three strands of embroidery floss. Okay. Uh, if you're going to do an eighth of an inch gingham, then I would probably go down to two strands of embroidery floss. So it's just not too heavy. And the other thing I want to show you, um, let's see if I can grab this. I'm going to grab a pin here. This is a uh, air and water, bowl, water soluble ink pen. I'm going to draw it for you first, so and then I'm going to stitch it because I want to get have you all get a visual of what I'm doing here. Okay, so I have my gingham out here. Oops. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do it as a cross stitch. So I come up here. I wonder. Uh, do, 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 do. No, I'm not going to be able to get any closer. I'll do my best. Okay, I'm going to come up at the bottom point and I will come up at the opposite point. So I'm creating an X just like that. Okay, I don't know. I hope you can see that. Okay, it's going to be like a cross stitch. I'll go down from there and come up right here at the next point and go the opposite way. So again, that looks like a cross stitch, right? But what this first stitch is called is the double cross stitch. So it's not just a single cross stitch, but it's a double one, which is going to remind us of a snowflake or what you might refer to as an asterisk. So after I come up from that point, then I can come down and go across this way and then one more time this way. And now I have an asterisk. Okay, so let me show you how that's done. I'm and I'm doing this upside down, so I hope I hope I can do this well enough. All right, I'm coming up at one point, and I am starting on the darker uh, squares, and I'm going to go just opposite and go down. So now that I have a cross, um, and then I will go the next direction and go the other way, okay, and go down here. Now, when you get really good at this, you can actually, what I always like to refer to of not, not pulling all the way through, you can go down and up in one swipe, right? Down and up in another swipe. But for purposes of today, I'm pulling it all the way through as soon as I'm done with one stitch. So first of all, you can see this cross stitch. Now I'm going to do the double cross stitch. So that means I'm going to go through the middle on one of the squares. Whoops. And you also want to hold it taut, but not too tight. So I will always be very careful as I bring those stitches through. So here's part of the asterisk. And then finally, I've got one more piece, or I should say one more stitch, and I'll go the opposite way. All right, can you see that? I have like an asterisk right there. So then, I you could, uh, you could, if you wanted to, you could skip and go to the next one. But before, before I do that, I'm going to do what is called the running stitch. And the running stitch means I'm not going to put that double cross stitch on until the next orange square. You see, I did an orange square here. I'm going to do an orange square here. But I need a running stitch to get over there. And that's really important so that I can be able to do my woven circles. So what I'm going to do is I will come up through the center side and back down. And you'll see here in a minute what's happening. And you can see there is a running stitch. I'm just going from one square to the next.
And now what will I do with the next orange square? Well, I'm going to do a double cross stitch again. So I go up on one corner, go down on the opposite corner. Whoops, grab that. Come back up on the, the next corner and go back down diagonal from it. So again, I have an X. Now, I will do the same thing as before to make it a double cross stitch. I will do one going across the from top to bottom in the center and I will go one going across horizontally from side to side through the center. Just like that. Okay, and again, now I have an asterisk. So what would I do next? I would actually do another running stitch. So I can, let's see, come from the center of one side and bring it back down to the other side. All right, so what you'll do is you continue doing this all the way across. So let me bring up my next, my next example. Okay. Oops. Okay. Oh, you know what I just realized? Ah, because I was doing it upside down, I didn't realize I was going the wrong direction. These running stitches actually are going to go up and down. I apologize. Up and down. See what I've done here? This is what I get for doing it upside down. So I have an asterisk, up and down. Asterisk, up and down. Asterisk, up and down. Does that make sense? So same stitch. It's a running stitch, but I did not go horizontal. Now on this next one, I will go horizontal to the next row underneath, okay? So what do I mean by that? I will go to the one just underneath the asterisk, come up. Okay, oops, I got a little knot in it. Darn it. Let me get rid of that. There we go. Okay. And go down this way. That knot doesn't want to let me do this. Okay. And at that point, I'll skip and go to the opposite square and down. Okay, so do you see how the, these are, are, it's a running stitch. I'm skipping every other square. Just like that. And I will skip a square and do it again. And go through. Okay, so now I've created my running stitches going underneath each of the double cross stitches. And I'm just going horizontally this time. Okay, so then the next thing I'll do is I'll go to the next row and I will repeat, because I'm on an orange square again, I'm going to repeat this same double cross stitch down here. Double cross stitch, double cross stitch, double cross stitch. Oh, let me back up. Remind, reminding myself to not forget to do the vertical right there. So let me just do one to show you and then I'll show you how the woven uh, circle is done. So I'm coming up and down, uh, doing a cross stitch, and then pretty soon it will become a double cross stitch. Okay, there's the stitch. Now I'm going to go to the center. Oops. And go this way. And again, the opposite direction. Okay, so there we have that. Okay, so I have an asterisk underneath there. 
what am I going to do? I'm going to do a running stitch, but I'm doing it vertical. So for me, it's upside down, but we know what we're doing now here. Okay, I'm going to go and do a vertical. Okay. All right, can you see that? So these running stitches are going to help me create the final stitch, which is the woven circle. So you would continue that. What would be my next one here? It would be the double cross stitch, like an asterisk. Then I would do a running stitch up and down, double cross stitch, running stitch up and down, double cross stitch. Okay, let me grab my next example. Let's see, and it's this one right here. Let me get my needle threaded real quick. Doo -doo. Yeah, there we go. Okay. All right, so with this, you see the double cross stitches and you see the running stitches. So what do I do next? What you'll do is you come up to the top of the bottom running stitch and you just pull that up and you're going to then weave your thread underneath each of those running stitches in a circle. So I go underneath there, I travel and go underneath there. It's not going through the material. It is only going through the uh, stitch, right underneath the stitch, I should say. I come back around. The whole idea is you wanna do it twice. You wanna go in a circle two times. So I do that again. Whee! <laughs> Let me pull my thread. Whee! So fun! <laughs> Uh oh, I let my needle come unthreaded. Let me do that again. Okay, and you go around that twice. So I go underneath the second one. Again, I'm just, just making it go underneath. And then I'll finally push it back down where I started from and pull it through. And I have a woven circle. Isn't that beautiful? That's going around that square. So then I go to the next one. I'm going to go start at the top of the bottom. Okay, the top part of the bottom. So I'll come up through there, through the material, through the fabric, and now once again I'm going to go around two times. And all I do is I weave it underneath weave it underneath, and I'm following the same direction as before. Weave it underneath, and weave it underneath. Again, I'm not going through the fabric. I'm simply running my needle underneath the stitch itself. I've done it once, it's time to do it one more time. I'm going to go underneath, because I do my circles twice, underneath, underneath woohoo and finally I'm back to where I started so I'm just going to place that needle right back down and there we go isn't that beautiful I'm going to do it just one more time super quick I'll bring it up at the top of the bottom one go underneath and you're going to get really the hang of this that it's going to be easy peasy. Now again, these are just kind of the basics of chicken scratch. There's so many ways you can take this. But even knowing this part is going to get stitching is going to get you stitching something absolutely beautiful. All right? And that's how easy it was. I hope that was easy. I it's it's a little difficult to explain it this way without a better like camera overhead of me, but hopefully you get the idea. And again, it might be something worth trying. It might be something worth trying 
just like to add a little trim to an applique or something like that. You could just, you know, do something so small. If you're just looking for that little added touch, you know, you could just add a little something like that. Um, so that is that. Alice said, your mother-in-law must have had incredible patience, beautiful, and what memorable heirlooms she created. Yeah, you're right, uh, Alice. And it was something she enjoyed so much doing. She just, she loved to do it. And whenever, like, people would, you know, the family would watch TV or whatever it might be, it would just be like, you knew that Bobby just had her little, her little box of, um, you know, her chicken scratch blocks. They were already marked. In fact, when to do the stars, like you see right here, she actually did have them marked, especially for those of us who were helping her. And she, hey, she even taught her sons. She's got six boys. Mike is one of six boys and one girl in the family. And they all knew how to do chicken scratch too, which I think is pretty cool. But she would mark these things as well. And she, you know, you could use like a, a little marking pen and just do a little, you know, dash, dash, dash. So that if, <laughs> if you got other people helping you or if you're doing it yourself and you, you, you don't want to have to count, you know, mark it out and uh, do it that way. Ramona said, ask, great question, Ramona. Is it always done on gingham? Not necessarily. That's a great question. I have actually seen it done. I should have brought a little, I should have brought a picture. I have seen it done on polka dots. Okay. So the, the, um, the, the polka dots are really a fun look as well. But the polka dots gave uniformity to that fabric so that you knew exactly where to stitch. All right. Gloria said she did a lot of this back in her teenage years. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, oh, Larry says you could use plaid. Yeah, absolutely. You know, really, anything that you think would has uniformity to it, you could utilize. Now, uh, let's see. Diana asked, can you match the thread color to the fabric? You could. When I was doing a little bit of more um, research on this this weekend, I one of the things that stood out to me was that you, most people will take the opposite color. So if you have a, a, a dark square, you would use a lighter thread. Now that's not the it all and all. I'm just saying that is mostly what I came across. Okay. You could do whatever you, you, you wanted, whatever look you were going for, but mostly it was, if it was a darker, darker one, you would actually go a darker square. You would go with a lighter, um, thread floss or opposite. Okay. You would, you would go opposite. And if it was a lighter square, you would go with a darker asterisk, which is, you know, what my mother-in-law did here too. And when you look at this, her, she has a dark purple embroidery floss on top of the white squares. Okay. So that would make sense, right? Marion asked, would the asterisks be done in the space between the polka dots? Yes. The polka dots are there, and then you do an asterisk with using the polka dots as your cornerstones. Mm -hmm. It might be worth, like, playing around with it, you know, with different ideas and things. Like, you know, you might think, I'm, I'm going to pull out a scrap piece of fabric. I've got some extra embroidered floss lying around. I've got, you know, a needle. I'm going to play around with it. I'm going to, I'm going to see what happens. What happens? I don't know about you, but I like, I'm a very curious person. Therefore, that's why I wanted to look up chicken scratch after it was brought up on Friday. I thought, I'm curious. I want to learn more, right? We all can do that same thing. We, we we're curious and we want to learn more. So we think, okay, let's, let's learn more, right? And we, and we try and go, huh, huh, 
I wonder what would happen if I go from this point to this point and this point to this point. Ah, oh, that doesn't look very good. Okay, I'll move on to the next one. What what would look what would happen if I tried this? You know, always keep yourself open and curious to the possibilities. And it's going to make your your experience so much more enjoyable. Okay? Stacy said she loves learning new things. Absolutely. Me too. I love it. Isn't that what life's about? Always learning, always growing, always trying to improve, always trying to find ways to become curious about the world. I love it. So, all right. Yay, Shauna said she's going to dig out her mother-in-law blocks and play. Yes, I love that. You might surprise yourself about how much you enjoy it. Even getting ready for today's three at three, and I was just stitching out some little stitch samples here. And I, because I, I did it on several because I didn't want you to have to wait for me to get done with all of them. I, I did it in stages, right? And I was sitting there and I thought, you know, this is so fun. This is so relaxing. It would be so sweet on a little girl's dress. You know, I could make it as a little pin cushion if I wanted to. How fun would that be? Because maybe I'm not ready to do something big, but I certainly could do a little pin cushion just to get my feel of like trying something new or trying something different or maybe trying something I haven't done for a long time, right? So... All right, uh, let's see. Oh, Cheryl, I love that. She said, after Friday with Amy, I got out my old booklets on Chicken Scratch, bought some gingham, and returned to handwork from my past. I love it. Thank you, Cheryl. That's wonderful. It's one of the reasons why we're all here is because we love to be inspired, right? To, these are things that we probably haven't heard about in a long time. And yet that conversation, talking just about gingham, took us right back, right? So it's pretty cool. All right. A lot of you are, are remembering those, the having memories of, of doing this with your, your aunts or your, your sisters or your mothers or your grandfathers or whoever, which is so cool. Uh, Larry, good point. He said, take a day and turn off all the modern uh, conveniences and see where instinct takes you. You might be surprised. It's so true. You might just be surprised. It's so fun. I, I can't wait to do more. I got just a little inkling as I was preparing this and I thought, oh, I want to do a little pincushion. I really do. What type and size of needle? Um, it really honestly doesn't matter. I, I, I use I use Cruel needles, C-R-E-W-E-L, when I do um, handwork. Uh, the reason why I like them is that they just have a little bit bigger eye. I think this is a size 7, I believe. But um, it's just, you know, as long as it's big enough to get your embroidery floss through. Okay? Especially for something um, like this.